Hey, yo. All right. <laughs> yo, what's going on, everybody? This is Shay coming back at you with another episode of the Emmaus Proposition. Man, what's happening with y'all? Hope everything's good. Hope everything's uh, going in your way, man. I hope God is favoring you. I hope he's blessing you, shining his face on you. Uh, everything is all good over here, man. Just kind of sh- <laughs> making my way through life. You know what I'm saying? So everybody's got their ups and downs. But uh, over here on the Amazed Proposition, man, we just going to continue to throw everything back in the direction of Christ. Everything is for him and through him and to him. He gets all the glory. Uh, he gets all of our hoorays, all of our tears. Everything goes to the foot of the cross and we celebrate in the resurrection of the empty tomb. So, man, I hope y'all doing good, man. Uh, as you can see by the title of today's episode, man, we're going to talk about death a little bit. And the reason we're talking about death is because it's just it's fresh on my mind. Uh, earlier this morning, I had to do a, uh, like a casualty notification with a family. And... Death is just one of those things, man, where we never really talk about it. We never discuss it. I know there's a lot of folks that that probably won't even listen to this episode uh, because people don't like to talk about death, man. It's, it's one of those things where we'd rather ignore it. We'd rather not think about it or see it or people talk about it in normal conversations and they're like, oh, no, we ain't going to talk about that. Uh, people try to gin up a... A uh, a will or or uh, or something like that. And they're like, no, nope, no, nope, no, nope, no. Nope. We ain't going there. We're not talking about it. <clears throat> and I don't know what that is, man. I there's just I think there's a fear there. There's a fear of this life is all we know. Fear of the nothingness. <laughs> it just made me think of the never ending story. Oh man, um, yo, I'm gonna keep it light because. Um, man, this stuff can get heavy. So, um, the notification I had to give earlier was of a a young dude that, uh, it took his own life. And unfortunately it's not, it's not the first, uh, death notification I've had to give, man. Um, and it's always, it's always tough to go up and knock on somebody's door, especially when they didn't know. And you're the first person to tell them, um, man, it's rough. It's rough, man. And the experiences that I've had with it have been, have been crazy. Um, and then you have the times when, man, I went on, I went on one notification, man. And the wife was like, yep, I know already. And good riddance. I'm like, Oh, Oh snap! Like it, that was that was a crazy scenario. Anyway, um, death has been something that I haven't I haven't dealt with personally a whole bunch of my life, man. For the most part, my family is is hyper young. So my grandma had my mom and my aunt. I, I want to say when she was in her twenties or something like that. My mom had me. She was a teenager. She was super young, and so really the only like the close well and then uh, so on my dad's side as well i don't think they were young but my my um my grandma and my grandpa they had they had seven kids and all of all of them are still are still hanging in there you know what i mean so i haven't dealt with death a ton but it's been something that you know in in the job i'm in in the profession I'm in, I, I deal with death quite often, man. And maybe you're wondering, man, how does death, <laughs> how does death point us to the glory of Christ? Yo, stay tuned because that's what we do on the Emmaus proposition, baby. <laughs> so, um, like I was saying, I haven't dealt with death a whole lot, man. My right before my grandma died, uh, and my grandma, man, she was, oh my goodness. She was probably the, the coolest lady that I think 
I'll ever have the privilege of knowing, man. Like there, there was nobody quite like her. Uh, and I'm not saying that cause I'm biased. Of course I'm biased. It's my grandma, but she was cool too, man. Like to, to hear the stories of how she grew up, left the house at a super young age, joined the military, um, went to married military, married some, some bum. And, uh, you know, I mean, thank, thank God for the dude. Cause you know, my mom and my aunt came out of it, but he didn't, he didn't continue to stick around like a man should. And so, but she was, she was boss. You know what I'm saying? Like she had, she had her kids and, um, pretty much raised them solo. And she had, uh, her siblings that she would have to take care of. She would, she would rush up on people. Like if you got beef, she would rush, she would be, she would be the person that would rush up on you. She used to be a prison guard. So she was like tough. She used to play like softball. And from what I understand about her stories, um, never liked running. So it would just, it was her aim to smash the ball as hard as she could. You know what I'm saying? She was just, she was a boss lady. And then, and then later in life, she became a theological beast. You know what I'm saying? Like just love the Lord. Um, not only pushed theology on her family, but like took over the kids ministry at the church, man, and just, just raised a generation of kids throughout the church that just, that knew God, that knew the scriptures, man. And, and whether or not, you know, we went on to, to love the Lord is, is a totally different conversation, but man, talk about a lady that, that dedicated her life, that just, that went from being tough in the streets to toughen the Lord, man, she was, she was a boss. And so, um, loved her, man. She had, she had wisdom coming out of every, every pore of her body, man. And so just to sit and listen and be upon her, man, it was, it was a, it was a privilege that I, that I hope I can pass on when my kids start to have kids. Like I, I want to be that type of grandpa. You know what I'm saying? So when she died, um, it was tough, man. It was t- it was tough because like I was losing such an important person in my life, but what really made it tough, uh, right before my grandma died, I spent a tour back at the, the main mortuary for the military. So it's, it's back in uh, Dover air force base. I spent four months there and it was a constant rotation. It's pretty much any, any military service member that dies overseas when they hit American soil for the first time, it's through Dover Air Force Base. So like it was it was right um during the during a time when we were still at conflict in the country around around two thousand and eight or so, somewhere in there. And we were seeing like body after body after body, man, and, and um and death. Death was like <clears throat> death was my job for four months. As I was working there, it was not only the mortuary section of it, it was also there because I was there working as a member of the chapel staff. I was there to support the families that would come in to watch us take their service member off the plane. So if you can imagine it, man, it's a, it's a big long, uh, runway, military runway. And there's all kind of planes like military planes, uh, C-17, C-5s out on the ramp. And it's, Usually they would come in at night, and so we'd have the family there. We take them out on a bus onto the flight line, man. And there's a there's a C seventeen that's parked right in front of us, and we're off to the side a little bit. And the family members the family members are watching as we take a a flag draped transfer case off of the plane uh, into the hearse, right? And it's it's full military honors. Um, there's so there's so much going on, um, but the emotion, man, like these these folks are like less than 24 hours from having been notified that their loved one had passed away, and some folks, man, they just they just didn't handle it well, and I had I had a couple instances where people they took off running down the flight line. They, cause they were yelling at the pilots. Like you, you can't leave. That's, that's not my son that's in there. You, you must have him still on there. And so they t- 
take off down the down the runway. You can imagine that's a that's a problem <laughs> at a military base. Um, man, I had I had one dad. Oh my gosh, I had one dad that him and his son were like they were best friends, and oh my Jesus, um, the dad is out on the runway <clears throat> and he's watching his son get take off the off the plane he knows it's him in there we're, we're telling them yeah that's because there's multiple transfer cases that people are taking off so we've got like multiple families that we're having to manage right and we're we're telling the dad yeah that that one's yours and uh as as the transfer case is coming off man and and typically what happens in the military when a flag goes by in front of your person it's customary to salute what I didn't know at the time was the dad was like a, a generational military man, right? And so great-grandfather, grandfather, uh, the dad, and then the son had all served in the military. And his son was the son was the first one that died in combat like that. And the dad was shook, man. He's sitting there on the flight line. He's his his body is like trembling. He's got the shakes, and uh, as the flag is going by, he renders a salute, and just out of nowhere, just belts out, "Who are Jimmy?" And you could, I uh, we asked some folks um, the next day who were on the other side of the flight line. They heard him all the way on the other side of the flight line. He he just he just screamed it, and I just. Like, I remember thinking to myself, like, man, here's a dad that, like, he loves his son. And over time, man, like, the, the stories began to compound, right? Like, there's another story about, like, there was this guy that committed suicide, and his girlfriend at the time, she was trying to break up with him over a phone call, and she listened as he shot himself. And uh, over time, that kind of stuff gets to you, man. I remember, I remember um, a, a combination of um, being there with the families, and you get this—you almost get this enmeshment with the family. Like almost every every family becomes your family, and and you take every death personal. At least I did at the time. And so you got all that, all that grief every day, all day, sometimes twice a day for four months. And then going into the mortuary, we would take them off of the plane the night before. And then the very next morning, we would open up the transfer case just to see what we got. And it could be anything. It could be absolutely anything in there. And sometimes we didn't know. And there was a lot of times that was just, you know, a normal body that's been shot or something like that. Uh, there was one time a, a guy had drowned, and so he was completely blue, um, like Smurf blue. It was it was it was odd. There was one plane crash that the only thing was left. It it just looked like a a burned log. It smelled like a burned log. You know what I mean? Like there's so much there's so much death, and there was so much grief in such a short span of time that. Um, in order for me to survive, because I was having like nightmares and stuff like that, right? Um, in order for me to survive, my brain shut off a piece of my emotion and death became, sadly, it became like not as impactful. Like my, my emotional capacity to handle death even to this day, to a certain extent, has been limited, man. It's it's been stunted. Like there's a bit, there's been a piece that's been cut off. Like I, I have deployed before, yo. I've been shot at with a missile, y'all. Imagine that flying along an airplane. I'm essentially in a flying gas station. My job, my first job in the military, and I see a, I see a, uh, we call it a man pad, but it's a, a shoulder a shoulder rocket long uh, shoulder launched rocket. <laughs> Coming up, shh, boom, explode like 
a thousand, two thousand feet beneath us, right? And and like, yeah, it sounds like a thousand, two thousand feet is not that far away. Let me tell y'all, it's close enough, and the pucker factor is real. Like when you see, because we saw, you could see the like the trail coming up at us, and when you see that man, um, I've I've I faced death a few times. In in that job, there was more than a few times that I faced death. Facing it the way I did at Dover changed me, um, and it's it's been something, man, that's that's haunted me <clears throat> ever since. Like I've I've never really been able to process it in the right way. And so when my grandma died, I'm bringing this back around. I promise. <laughs> when my grandma died, it was not only was it sad that I lost this lady that was so influential in my life, right? Uh, she's the person that introduced me to Jesus. Not only did I lose her, um, I couldn't grieve her. I couldn't. I couldn't. Um, I couldn't bring myself to to an emotional state where. I, f- I felt like would have been a healthy emotional state. I don't know. I, I know everybody grieves in different ways, right? Like I, I know all that kind of stuff, but for the lady that like was such a bedrock to who I am as a person, I don't feel like I, I was able to really fully process the fact that she died. And, um, and it's weird. Cause every now and then it'll pop up. Like there's little, um, if you ever been out to, um, Yellowstone National Park. They have the guys are out there, Old Faithful. And what, what a lot of people don't know is Old Faithful is actually an underground, an underground volcano, um, and it's it's letting off pressure. Um, so <laughs> it's it's North America's super volcano, y'all. Yo, if Yellowstone goes, this podcast is gonna be Jack. <laughs> Cause we all we all gonna be gone, um, but Old Faithful is the bleed off um, from the volcano, and I feel like every now and then I have this like this Old Faithful moment where I just break down crying, and a lot of times I won't know why. It's not that she comes up as as primary like in my mind. It's not like I was thinking about her, but not being able to grieve death in the right way has been, has been weird. And so when I go do death notifications like today and I'm there with the family and y'all, let me tell y'all, um, number one, death is not, there's nothing dignified about death. Uh, you get no dignity when you die. And, um, and two, Regardless of what you feel, <clears throat> somebody's going to miss you. And um, there's a lot of people that that live a life and they think, yeah, nobody's going to miss me. It'd be better off if I was gone. It'd be better for my family if I was gone. These these kind of like false thoughts, man. They're 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 lies. People will miss you when you're gone. And um, that was his family today. They're they lost a father, they lost a husband, they lost a son, you know what I'm saying? So they're, they're there and they're, and I'm, and I'm there and I'm trying to figure it out. And, uh, I'm trying to, not that I'm trying to figure anything out for them, man. Like uh, the best thing I could do as a caregiver in those situations, man, is just be present, man. There's a lot of people that get nervous in those situations. Cause they're like, I want to say the right thing to bring comfort. I feel like my words are going to help. And usually your words actually do more damage. And so I am, I am super selective on when I talk in those kind of situations because death is so, it's so heavy. It's, it's such an enemy of life. The Bible says the last enemy to be defeated is death. Um, and we also see in the Bible how Jesus, because he knows it's such an enemy of his people when he resurrects from the dead uh, the gospel writers, not the gospel writers, I'm sorry, the uh, the New Testament writers, they're able to mock death. Death, where's your sting now? What you going to do now, death? Our king has defeated you. Where are you going to go? Where are you going to hide? Like our, our king holds the keys to death in Hades. 
you got no power over us now. Like for the for the people of God, this great enemy that's ever right in front of us, right? Uh, I think a reason why a lot of people have a lot of the phobias they have, and I'm talking about like the actual phobias, right? Not like those phobias that people are tossing around these days when they just don't like how somebody's living. I'm talking about like actual phobias, actual like irrational fear, like the definition says it is. That might get me in trouble, y'all. The people who have actual phobias, I think at the base of all that is like this this underlying fear of death. If you ask somebody with a with a real life phobia, like what it feels like, it, it they say it like it feels like living death. <clears throat> so for like an agoraphobic that's scared to go outside, the the process of them walking out of their home into the sunlight, into the air, putting their feet on grass feels like they're walking into death. Uh, people with like arachnophobia, the fear is so great that the thought of a spider feels like something inside of them is like is trying to kill them. <clears throat> Death is a great enemy, man. I'm sorry for all the all the coughs and everything, coughs and and stuffy noses and all that jazz, man. It is what it is. Anyway, um, death is not fun. Death is that is that one thing that there's never really a way to conquer it. Death has a 99.9999% success rate. There's only been one person in, in the history of the world that's ever been able to defeat it. That's the Lord Christ, man. He's he's the only one that's that can say like was an actual person who walked the earth, who entered into death and three days later rose from the grave. And I'm not talking about some like fairy tale story or some some mythological um, tryst on on whatever. Like there, there's other cultures that that have that have like they want they wish people could rise again from the dead. The Egyptian pharaohs would uh, would be buried along with all their treasures and stuff like that and servants and all kind of stuff uh, so that in the hopes if um, if they did if they did enter the afterlife, they would have some wealth to go with them. But if they could resurrect, then they would have not only wealth, but servants and they could recapitalize on their power. Right. Um yeah, there's there's plenty there's plenty of of cultures that have wished for it, and there's only been one that's ever done it in the, in the history of the world. And so, death is one of those things that is is it's hard and it's terrible, man. And um, for the folks, you know, if you're listening to this and um, you know somebody that's ever talked about suicide or if you're struggling with it yourself, man, reach out to someone. Don't, don't allow that thought to fester. If if you know somebody that's struggling with that stuff or if, or if someone has, uh, it's in your life and they've attempted it, man, you'll pause this and go check on them. Just, just give them a call and, and check in and see how they're doing. Uh, let them know you're thinking about them, that you love them, that they're, they're an important um, part of your life. It's, it's, as human beings, man, we get, we get so, uh, lied to by the world, our own flesh and by Satan, like these three enemies, they surround us and they're afflicting us from every side. And the lie is that we can do this thing called life on our own. Like if, because people have hurt us, because people suck sometimes, uh, sometimes even the people that are not supposed to suck, suck worse, (laughs) like, I get it, man. And and sometimes it feels like, man, instead of being hurt, I would rather just go at it by myself. Like as opposed to getting my heart broken by this boyfriend, girlfriend, as opposed to getting my, getting my spiritual self stomped on by my old church, as opposed to like listening to my parents 
get on me again and again and again and again, and I'm so sick of it. Instead of going through all that, the lie is, well, just do it by yourself. Just strike it on your own, and you'll be okay. And the problem is, the Bible says that Satan prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. If you ever watch the Animal Planet, and you look at one of those documentaries they have like about lions and stuff like that, or, or any, any animal of prey. Cause I feel like leopards would probably do the same thing. Uh, cheetah probably do the same thing, but I, I like lions. So I'm gonna say lions, <laughs> lions <clears throat> never really go after the herd. They'll chase the herd like initially to call it kind of cause some chaos. But what they really love is for that one panicked one to go off by itself and that's the one they pursue. They pursue the lame one. They pursue the one that's in isolation. <laughs> and a lot of times, man, we 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 do ourselves an injustice when we say that we can we can do this life by ourselves, man. Like we've been injured by these people that are supposed to love us and we go off in isolation and next thing you know, man, death is just knocking at the door. And, um, man, as I think about it biblically, right, we have Adam and Eve in the garden and God never intended death to be a thing. If you, if you look at, at his creation, um, life was supposed to flourish. You know what I'm saying? I, I don't know how that process was supposed to work because the, the only thing I know right now is death. You know what I'm saying? I, I only live in a world of death. So I don't know what that pre-world looked like. But I do know that death was um, death was not in the beginning of creation. It, it, it was allowed into creation. And so when you have Adam and Eve there and God says, man, the, the day that you rebel, the day that you eat of this fruit, then I'm telling you not to eat the day you do that, you're going to die. And I don't know if they thought that God was talking in hyper hyperbole. I don't know if it was just a, it was a continual assault by the serpent. Like it wasn't just a one-time thing where he tempted Eve. Like it was a day after day after day grind where he's just like, he's, he's reasoning with her on all the reasons why she should rebel. There's, there's an awesome book. There's an awesome book right here. C.S. Lewis's space trilogy. This one right here, right? Calandria or Calandra. I don't know how you pronounce that. Anyway, it gives like a re it gives like a retelling of like the Garden of Eden scene uh, on a different planet. So it's pretty cool. But in that book, it was like a it was like a continual day after day assault where this evil being is just like it's coming after uh, this Eve figure. He's like, it's actually it's more loving to have your own mind. It's more loving to. um to rebel that's actually that's actually a better expression of love which is what kills me uh, this this is a sidebar note y'all like the people that argue so hard for free will um from my perspective only feels like the same argument that that satan would give why would we argue for something that satan is arguing for anyway um They let death in. They let death in. And, and God has to uh, make the first kill. He, he slaughters an animal. It, the Bible doesn't say this, but it says he clothed them with animal cloth. So God like has to, has to kill a part of his perfect creation in order to cover the sin, the rebellion of these two people. The, the very next scene is, is Cain and Abel. Cain um, slaughters his brother Abel in the field and then, throws his hands up and says, I'm not my brother's keeper. And God tells him, man, yo, sin is, sin is waiting on the, at the door for you. It's, it's knocking for you. This thing, this thing of death, it's right there. And then death reigns, death reigns for thousands upon thousands of years, man, the, the killing, the murders, we come to the book of judges and it's awful and bloody and 
there's um there's death that's not supposed to be there there's there's a psychopath serial killer in samson there's um there's a guy who allows his concubine to be uh, salted to death and then torn into pieces like death death becomes the natural state of things And then we come to the New Testament and we see Jesus right there. And Jesus says, like, I came to seek and save the lost. Those those that are they're lost in this thing called sin, like they're they're dying and I meant for them to live forever. I have a, I have a problem with that. And because they can do nothing about it. Because, like, the thing that's ruling in their lives has such mastery and control of it, I have to, I have to exchange my righteousness for their unrighteousness. I have to exchange my goodness f- for their sinfulness. So Christ sets aside a part of his holy self. He, he leaves his heavenly throne. He's, he's born of uh, a virgin. And, and right at his birth, man, we see Herod slaughtering innocent lives. He said any, any kid two-year-old two year old or under, slaughter him. Another case against abortion. We see, we see death right there at Jesus's feet, man. And God saves his son. Like he sends him off into Egypt away from King Herod. And we see, um, we see the destruction that, that sin brings as he's, as he's healing people throughout his ministry. And then we come to the cross, man, and we see him beaten and bruised and beard pulled out and, and, and thorns jammed into his head and spit on. And, um, we see him die. A gruesome death. Don't read over the execution scene of the cross too quickly. It's it's death in its most despicable. But we see Jesus dying it. Died died as a common criminal when he had done nothing wrong. Died because you and I are criminals that des- actually deserve that punishment. We sin we sin daily, hourly sometimes, against a holy God. The, the, the higher the authority, the more brutal the consequence of sinning against them. I guess it's one thing for me to steal a piece of candy from my kid, right? There's nothing they could do from it. <laughs> if I steal a piece of candy from the President of the United States, I, I got Secret Service on me, right? What do, what do you think stealing a piece of candy, like if it, if it changes from my kid to the President, what do you think it changes from the President to God? even stealing a piece of candy is a cosmic offense. And because of that cosmic offense, the book of Romans says the payment for your cosmic sin on an hourly basis, you criminal is death. That's the payment you get. And God is looking at this and this is the law. He's like, but I don't, I have to find a way. And Jesus is like, yeah, we got to find a way. This is my bride. I got to go rescue her. So he comes and he rescues his bride. The bride who, just like the prophet Hosea had with his, uh, he had a wife of the streets. (laughs) In the same way that she was being unfaithful to him, we're unfaithful to God on a daily basis. But God still pursues, man. He said, that's my bride. I love her, man. So he comes and he rescues his bride. He gives us, he trades our filthy rags for his holy and righteous and clean rags. And we get a chance to say, death, where's your sting? Why are you laying there looking like a chump, death? <laughs> our, king, our king has defeated you. Like Samson crushed the head or, or chopped off the head of Goliath. I'm sorry, like David chopped off the head of Goliath. So our king chops off the head of death. What you going to do now, chump? We get to live for eternity. Like death may kill the body, 
but the body has nothing to do with God's what God's going to do with us after this body has has ceased to function the way it functions now. And 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 death the whole time was the cause of that way back in Genesis when God said, "In the day that you rebel, you'll surely die." We've been dying ever since. In a day like today, man, where it's where it's so tough to lead a family through uh, the death of a loved one, not to mention if a loved one takes their own life, because then like then we have these stigmas that come into play, right? Because we we play this this game on the inside where um, we fail to recognize that all of us are tainted by sin, and we say stuff like, um, "I just don't, I don't respect." A person who takes their own life. A person was such a coward. How could they take the easy way out? Oh yeah. They they um they just couldn't they just couldn't take it. So they took their own life, man. Like like as if <laughs> as if, right? We we are sin stained people. And all of us have it. And all of us have the potential for sin to run our lives into the ground. Whether that be living a stressful life where all you think we do is worry about money and we, we blow away our our relationships with our friends and our family and, and, and our coworkers and we and we piss it all into the ground. And then death rejoices because now it finally has us in isolation. Or a person that is is so hurting on the inside and these these demonic forces are rising up in their life so hard that the only escape they feel like they have is just is just to end it. The first person and the second person are both dealing with demonic forces. The world, our flesh, and Satan, they're all after us. And the only hope we have only hope we have in this life is that Christ would come and and rescue and redeem us to trade in our unrighteousness for his righteousness for for him to give us an inheritance of eternal life it's the it's the only hope we have in this life man if you if you ask somebody who doesn't believe they'll, they'll say like there's nothing after this man it's such a i could i could never i could never cling to anything like that man you mean after after all this that we're going through right now, after everything we're going through, the end of it is nothing? Nothing wins? Seriously? This I think that's the one part about the never ending story that bothered me the most. Um Atreyu tries his best to get the uh the childlike empress her name come to find out there's nothing he do about it and the world literally falls apart because of the nothing and the nothing wins and uh it's such a it's such a as i'm thinking about it right this second it's such a hopeless movie nothing wins except a little spark of of life where everything regrows right and um I look forward to the day when um, God comes and he brings his kingdom down and he sets it on top of our reality and says, death is no more. Dying is no more. Sadness is no more. There's no more tears. There's no more crying. There's no more having to hold someone's mom after they've made a terrible decision. There's no more having to restrain a father from grieving his son there's only joy there's only praise there's only laughter and and joy and brilliance brilliance so much that there's no more need for the son that's the day i look forward to man when when death is no more Oh, death, where's your sting? I I, I look forward to that, man. Uh, I haven't gotten a tattoo in a long time, but (laughs) I think I would get that one. 
Anyway, y'all heard me ramble on for long enough. Um, man, reach out to somebody today. Tell them you're thinking about them. Check in on them. Um, do some kind of remembrance for the family members you've lost or, or a coworker that you've lost. Um, and pray. Pray, man. Pray that um, that people are not swallowed up by death because there's there's this death, right? And this death is, is terrible and awful. And like I said, there's no dignity in it. You poop yourself after you die. People got to see your naked body and, and cut you open and take out your organs. And like your family fights over all your possessions and, and the kids are nasty to each other. And like there's 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 no dignity in it. All all the all the stuff you you hope doesn't happen when you die prob- probably does. So reach out to folks, man. Trust in Christ, who is the who holds the keys to death in Hades. He is master over them. He has he has conquered it. He's he's the only person who has. And he has said, um, for those who believe in me, I give you the right to become a child of God. Belief. Belief. Belief that Jesus is who he says he is. And he rose from the grave. It's belief, man. It's, it's allowing the Holy Spirit of God to take your sin-ridden body and breathe new life into it, man. The, the only thing this body is destined for is death. And God said, I am offering you life and not just life, but abundant, everlasting life. Man, choose it. Talk to somebody about it. Warn them. Death is not pretty, but life is beautiful and eternal life. Psh, child, please. <clears throat> anyway. It's good to be with y'all, man. I'm glad y'all are joining me on this journey down the road to Emmaus. And that's our proposition, man. The proposition is that even death, even as we sit down to talk about death and, and dying and wills and and how to how to process death and suicides and cancer and Parkinson's and MS and all of these things. All of it ultimately points back to Christ, man. All of it ultimately points back to Christ. And like God says in Isaiah 42, um, don't be dismayed. Don't be fearful. Um, I love you. Isaiah 42, 10. It's not 42, 10. It's somewhere else. God says, I love you. And don't be dismayed. I'm with you. I've defeated death. Trust in me. Cling to me. Hope in me. Have faith in me. That's what we need, man. And so I will, um, I'll be praying for y'all. Um, y'all please pray for me. Um, let's hope that God comes back in all of his glory and, and rejoice in the day when he puts it all to shame. So please make sure to like, share, and subscribe. If you're over on YouTube, please share what we're doing over here. If you're on the podcast, thank y'all for the love and support, man. I appreciate y'all. Um, hit me up in the email, man. I love to pray for you. I love to pray with you. And until next time, y'all grace, peace.